Amen. Good morning. Great to see you guys. You guys do that in unison every week. It's great. It's really awesome. Um, so, hey, we're continuing uh, through our series through the Gospel of Mark. If you're new here with us, we've just been going verse by verse through the uh, the whole book, and we're going to be going all the way to Easter, actually. It's going to be amazing. We're going to hit the resurrection, the resurrection on Easter. Isn't that cool how God timed all that out for us? It's, it's going to be great. Uh, so last week, Brandon did a great job of bringing God's Word to us and uh, revealing the heart of the Good Shepherd to us. I'm just so thankful for uh, his sermon and the, the prep that he put in to bring God's Word uh, to us. Um, this week, we're picking up uh, and Jesus' fame is growing. After he feeds 5,000 men plus children and women with uh, five loaves of bread and two fish, more and more people are coming to Jesus and crowds are gathering around them. And we shouldn't be surprised. Why? Because people love free food, don't they? <laughs> they love it. You want to get a crowd? Throw out some free food. Um, but here's the thing Jesus does. He, he refuses to be pulled off of his mission. Uh, his mission is to complete the work that his father came to give him to do. And as the crowd is growing, here's what Jesus does. If you've got a Bible, we're going to pick up in Mark chapter 6. We're going to look at verses 45 through 47 here. Um, immediately, he made, he commanded, he forced his disciples to get into a boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethesda, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. So Jesus makes the disciples go to the other side of the sea, or at least start heading in that direction. And what we see is, is that Jesus sends his disciples intentionally into a storm alone. Um, he, he plays the usher, he, he's letting all the people go back to their homes, and he sends the crowds away, and as they leave, he goes up on the mountain to spend some time with his father. Now, here's why this is significant for us. Uh, we have three detailed instances in the Gospels of Jesus intentionally uh, separating himself from his disciples to pray. One of those is the night before Jesus calls his disciples. It's a big night. He wants to make sure he has the father heart of God in his bones before he calls these men to follow him. The third time we see this happen is in the Garden of Gethsemane, right? The night before he's crucified. These are big kind of capstone moments for Jesus. The third time, this moment right here. This moment in Jesus' ministry is a watershed moment of his glory being revealed to his disciples. Now, here's what I mean by his glory, uh, meaning his, his worth, his significance, his value. It's, it's not something that you can just make someone else see. You see, glory has to first be revealed to you, and then your heart has to be prepared to receive it with eyes of faith, you know? It's that moment when you begin to see Jesus as he really is. And what you begin to know about Jesus is that when you see him as he is, at the same time you realize he sees you as you really are, not who we hoped we would be. You know, typically his glory is most pronounced for us when we are in the darkest moments of our lives. I know that's true for me. We can't comprehend who Jesus really is until we get into a situation where he is all that we have. I think there's this common notion uh, that being a Christian is about, yes, believing the gospel, but honestly living it out in our own strength. Years ago, someone super close to me was going through a, a very challenging situation. Her husband was clinically depressed and incapable of much outside of waking up and getting out of bed each day. She was carrying the workload inside and outside of the house and the emotional weight of the entire dysfunctional family that she was a part of. And I just knew that it was crushing her. And so I asked her, hey, how are you really doing? And she kind of slapped a smile on her face as she talked to me and said, I'm doing pretty good. After all, God promised to never give me more than I can handle. And I kindly nodded to her, but then I decided to go for it. And I said, Mom, <laughs> you know I love you, 
but you're believing a lie. God's word doesn't say that anywhere in it. That's not what the Bible teaches. Yes, the Bible teaches that Jesus will not allow us to be tempted without a way of escape. That's what it says. But the Bible is filled with stories of people who God allowed to be crushed by their circumstances. And why? Because he knows what we actually need. Our struggles in this life are not at odds with his goodness toward us. We have to stop drawing that false conclusion. And as I look around this room today, here's who we are. We are people that are struggling forward in the faith. Some of us struggle to be liked. We just want to know that we're enough by anyone. Some of us struggle to believe that we are loved by others, by God, by our family, by anyone else in this world. Some of us struggle in our loneliness. We just want good friends to share the burdens of life with, the joys of life with. We just want to be married. That's some of us. We just want to be seen and known by others. Some of us struggle with besetting addictions and dependencies that drive us further and further into isolation and shame. And whatever it is for you this morning, you need to know that Jesus is not just a general Savior. He didn't just die for the vague sins of the world or our world. He is specific, precise, and definite in his compassion, redemption, and comfort, church. And the Holy Spirit desires to bring all of that to us into focus this morning in a way that we might least expect it, through our struggles. If you're a note taker, here's our uh, big idea for today. It's kind of the sermon in a sentence. The only way to surrender to his glory in our hearts is to experience him in the struggles of this world. So this scene, the way that it came uh, kind of into focus for me this week was like four different snapshots. So I don't know if, you know, you've ever had a Polaroid camera before, but you kind of take the picture and you hang it up or whatever. I want you to imagine four different snapshots of God revealing his glory to his disciples and his glory to us. And those snapshots are this. The first one is this. There is a chasm that we feel. The second one is this. There is a struggle that we face, the human condition. The third one is this, there is a glory that he reveals. And the fourth one is this, the comfort that we receive. So let's dig into that uh, together. The chasm that we feel, it's, it's, it's the chasm between God's glory and our depravity. So this kind of blew me away this week as I was looking at this. The first thing that Jesus does to protect his mission and the hearts of his disciples that he's going to entrust his mission to is he sends them away from the fame of the crowds because the fame of the crowds had a hardening effect on his disciples' hearts. Listen to this from Mark 6, 52. It's one of those kind of mind-blowing passages. Okay, so they see Jesus feed like 10,000 people with like a kid's lunch, right? I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. And the scriptures say they did not understand about the loaves. Something wasn't, wasn't connecting. They weren't seeing his glory. They weren't seeing Jesus for who he was because their hearts were hardened. Um, in my experience, glory without struggle can do this to you. It can lead you to see the miracle without the miracle worker. It can lead us to experience the Lord as some kind of cosmic vending machine. You know what I mean? So the disciples, they're not getting who Jesus is when he feeds these 5,000 plus people. So what does Jesus do? In his great compassion and love, he sends them straight into the middle of a storm alone. They're not in this storm because they've been disobedient and rebellious little disciples, right? They are perfectly obeying Jesus, and they find themselves in the middle of a storm where they're fending for their lives. Friends, sometimes you get into a storm when you're being obedient. Do you know that? That's what the disciples were doing here. It's not always because of a consequence of your disobedience. And they're heading into this storm because Jesus loves them, and it's what's best for them. It's the only way they'll see him as he is. 
So Jesus is on the mountain. He's celebrating his unity with his father. You kind of see these little cartoons up here. So he's, he's up there. The disciples are out on the sea because they're obeying him. And there is this chasm between he and his disciples. And I think it's a portrait of the gospel for us. We cannot experience the grace of the gospel unless we know about this chasm, that there is a distance between us and God. It doesn't matter how you find yourself alone and terrified and exhausted in this world, but that you do see yourself as you really are, with the chasm between you and Jesus. Now, here's how Jesus put it to the Pharisees in John chapter 8, after he forgave this really sinful woman who was caught in the act of adultery. The Pharisees come up, and they're, they want to they bring Jesus up on charges. And here's what he says in John chapter 8. He's, he's, he's looking at the Pharisees, um, and he says this to them. You are from below, and I am from above. You are of this world, and I am not of this world. In other words, there is a chasm between us. I told you that you would die in your sins, and he's saying this to the religious leaders of the day, right? It's supposed to be spiritual peers of Jesus. For unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins, and that chasm will be forever, he says to them. It doesn't matter, friends, if you were caught in adultery or you are a Jewish leader in the synagogue. It doesn't matter if you've been in church your entire life or somehow you just saw the sign and made a U-turn into the parking lot this morning. It doesn't matter how you got in here this morning. What matters is that you actually believe is that there is a chasm between you and God. We are in the middle of a storm, and Jesus is distinct from that storm because he is of his Father, and we are of this world, as he says. And our hearts will stay hard toward Jesus unless we believe that this morning, unless we believe there's actually distance between us. So my question to you is this, is do you actually believe that there is a chasm between you and God? Do you think that he's different than you? Are you tired of pretending and performing, as my discipleship group's been talking about, your way into the kingdom? your way into God's approval of your life? Are you tired of minimizing your sin and minimizing your struggle? Good, right? Good, because that means your heart is ready to receive his grace. It's ready for his glory to be revealed so that you can see Jesus is who he says that he is. But it takes a storm to get us there, and Jesus will send you right into the middle of it, friend. The second thing that we see here is this. The next snapshot or Polaroid we take is is what it's like to be the disciples out on the Sea of Galilee that night. So the second point is this. There's a struggle that we all face, and as Megan talked about earlier, it's the human condition. It's the human condition. Have you ever been in a bad storm before, like a really bad one? I have. uh, Not the kind of storms Georgia gets, though. I've been in those two. But when I was 19, I was heading back home Uh, from work on Christmas Eve from one of the 40-plus jobs I've had in my life. Uh, That's a true story. Um, And uh, and I was working at UPS at the time. I I had worked at the International Hub in Louisville, Kentucky, and I loaded packages into uh, the bellies of aircraft. So if you ever need help moving, I'm your guy. I'm like the Tetris guy, right? I know how to put it in to the U-Haul truck to make it work. Um, But the only problem with this particular night was that I had been working for 12 hours because we got a foot of snow. Uh, And it was frigid chaos at the airport. So here I am, 19 years old, driving 45 miles home in one foot of snow, and it's still coming down. And it's a blizzard, and you can't see anything. But, you know, I had to get home for Christmas. I couldn't stay at the airport for Christmas. And I didn't even call and ask my mom. I just went and... uh, You know, some of you have driven in a really bad storm like this before, but when you're in the middle of the storm, you're not thinking about the big picture, right? What are you thinking about? You're thinking about how do I safely get to my destination, and it's the only thing that you're thinking about. So in that whiteout blizzard, I was not focused on how good the snow was for the ecosystem, right? You know, how the snow would nourish the ground and produce good crops in the spring and how the lakes and rivers would have sufficient water levels because of this great snowfall that we had and how the world would work much better because of the snow. Heck, I wasn't even thinking about building a snowman yet, right? I had to get home first. Then I was going to build a snowman, you know? 
I had to get home for Christmas. And so I white knuckled it all the way home, sliding on and off the road and making it home for Christmas. And these kind of circumstances, you know, whether it be a literal or a metaphorical storm, have a blinding effect. They cause you to stop everything else, don't they? This is what it's like for Jesus' disciples that night. They are, they are laser focused on what is in front of them. Here's what, here's what uh, verse 48 in Mark 6 says. It says, Jesus saw that they were making headway painfully. <laughs> the wind was against them. And in about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them and he was walking on the sea. So Jesus is looking at the whole picture. He can see he can see the blue sky and he can see the storm, right? It's the night, so he can't see blue sky. But anyway, he's God. You get the picture. Um, he can see the whole picture of what's happening. The disciples can only see the storm. Think about that in your life. God sees the whole picture. He loves you. He promises good for your life. But you can only see what is in front of you. He's on the calm mountain celebrating unity with his father, and he sees the disciples struggling for their lives. The Greek here literally means that they were tormented, right? The disciples are tormented by their struggle in the storm. To put the struggle in perspective, they've been on the sea for probably somewhere between seven and nine hours because we're told it's the fourth watch of the night, which is between 3 and 6 a.m., they can't ease across with the sail because the wind is against them. To obey Jesus to get to the other side, they've got to bootstrap it and oar across the Sea of Galilee. But it's like they're on a treadmill, right? I mean, they are just rowing their little hearts out, and they're going nowhere. And they can't obey Jesus. They can't get across. They don't even know if they're going to live. Um, and Jesus calls them to go to this other side. He asked them to do something Impossible. Now, why does Jesus ask his disciples to do something he knows they can't do? Because to feel the struggle of the storm in this life is the pathway to see glory, church. God asks all of us to do something that we can never do, right? To be holy as he is holy. We can't do that on our own, right? We can't obey him perfectly. We can't obey the law perfectly. He asks us all to do something that we can never do so that we'll get to the end of ourselves and see ourselves united with him and our obedience being propelled by his life inside of us. We get so frustrated by how hard life is, and what do we do? We despair. I'm there from time to time just like you, and I just wish I could be farther along so many days of my life just like you do. So get, get the picture, it's this. In the darkest part of the night, the fourth watch, it's as dark as it gets, Jesus shows up and you realize what? That he has known you all along. He's known all about where you're at all along. That those unique burdens that we carry and the despair that we feel, they're actually personal to Jesus. They're not just uh, anonymously circumstantial. They're personal to Jesus. He's not about to leave us alone in the storm. He's not about to leave these disciples alone in the storm. What we see is that storm is a conduit. It's a form of God's mercy for us all because we're all on the same struggle bus, church, right? We just occupy different seats. You guys are almost awake. These guys are rowing their hearts out and they're getting nowhere. They're on this treadmill, and it's blinding for all of us We're in those moments because we cannot zoom out and have the perspective of Jesus who sees the full picture of what God is up to in our lives. But here's what I want you to understand about Jesus. He sees us in the struggle. He doesn't always take the struggle away, but he's burdened by the struggle that you're in. It's personal for Jesus. He's burdened to such a degree, think about this, that he enters into that burden of sin with you and he crosses that chasm. And not only that, he takes it upon his shoulders. And what we see is he gets into the boat and fully identifies with these guys. Here's what's true about the frame we see our lives from. You know, right here with these guys, you know, right here just seeing the storm, just in the middle of it. 1 Corinthians 13 says it like this. This is the love chapter, but I think the greatest part of the love chapter is the end of it. It's right here. Paul says this. He says, for we know in part. 
We don't know the whole thing. We know in part. We're limited. We're finite. He's infinite. And because of that, we prophesy in part. We use all of the spiritual gifts in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. That's a reference to the perfect man, Jesus himself, returning. When Jesus returns, the partiality, the things that we don't understand, the glimpses where we only see the storm and not the whole picture, that will all pass away, he says. And then he gives this example. He's like, it's like this. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, right? I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. I would sell my soul for a bag of Skittles, right? But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. I grew up. He says in the same way, we'll grow up in our perspective of what God's up to in our lives. He says it's like this, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly. Now, back in that day, they had... Uh, they didn't have mirrors like you have today. They didn't show details like, you know, the pores of your skin. They're too detailed today, right? Amen? Um, they had these kind of blurry, they had these blurry kind of mirrors, that, you know, barely polished metal that you would look at yourself, and you would see yourself dimly. You couldn't see yourself clearly. He uses that as a familiar thing for them. He says, for now, it's like this. We see ourselves in a mirror like that. Not a good mirror. It's not detailed. He says, but when we see him face to face, but, but then when he returns, we'll see him face to face. Now in part, then I shall fully know, right? I will fully know. I don't yet fully know because I have already been fully known, past tense. So God already fully knows us even though we don't fully know him. You see, that's how the gospel works. That's what the Spirit is hammering out through your struggle in this world. You can't see the full picture. All you see is the storm. But on that day when he returns, it'll all be perfectly clear. We get Jesus' glory in glimpses. Jesus sees and he knows every single detail of every single one of our stories. He knows and he sees in ways that no one else can see. No one else including ourselves. Paul would say this in 2 Corinthians. He says, I can't even judge myself because I'm not the best judge of myself, right? Right? No one else, including ourselves, can see what Jesus sees about the trajectory of our lives. You may feel unseen this morning. You may feel unseen by your parents, kids. You may feel unseen by your spouse. They don't really know me. You may be unseen by your friends, by your boss, heck, even your pastor, right? Why? Because all of us see in part, none of us can see the big picture compared to him. But I want you to pay attention to this. When he returns, we will be face to face with Jesus. This is the, this is the, the, the perfect explanation of what it's like for his glory to be fully revealed to us. There will finally be no distance, no separation, no struggle anymore because we'll be with him fully. So my question to you is this, as we keep moving on to our next portrait here, where is your struggle of sin leading you to today? What would change if you could actually zoom out while you're on that boat and see Jesus in control of the storm on the mountain with his father praying, walking out on the sea to meet you? What would change if that was you? What would change if you knew that Jesus was on the way to be in the boat with you? Your struggle is an anonymous, and it won't last forever, friend. What if the only way to experience the real person of Jesus and the benefits of believing in him were through that struggle? That's the question we have to answer today. So we've got the first two snapshots. We've got the, 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 the chasm that we, that we feel and the struggle that we face, which leads us to the glory that he reveals Storms make way for the display of the glory of God, friends. Okay, so this is one of the more perplexing texts in the entire New Testament. That's not my words, just because I had to preach this and I couldn't give it to Brandon. But um, he, he always makes that joke. I preach hard things too, man. Where are you at? Uh, 648 goes on to say this. He says, when, they saw they were, when he saw they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them, it's about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea, <laughs> He meant to pass by them. What am I supposed to do with it? He meant to pass by them. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost. We got ghost stories now too. 
And they cried out, for they all saw him, and they were terrified. This was not a godly fear, right? They were literally scared. Uh, but immediately he spoke to them and said, take heart, it's I. Do not be afraid. This, this probably isn't how it went down, but when I first read this, here's what I imagine. Jesus has been praying all night with his father. Uh, he's been uh, just locked in with the Lord. And uh, his disciples are out on the sea. He sees them struggling. He, you know, he knows they're going to be fine. They don't think they're going to be fine. And so he's just uh, going to meet them on the other side, right? He's just going to go on over to Bethesda and, and meet them. And, uh, and he's walking out on the sea because it's the quickest way to get there. And all of a sudden they see him and he's like, oh, crap. I guess I got to help him now, right? You know, I got to get over here. That's probably not how it happened. But when I first read it, I was like, maybe, I don't know. Um, luckily, I didn't stop with that interpretation. Um, because there's a significant uh, phrase here that's uh, all throughout the Old Testament. That phrase, passing by. Um, the language of passing by is language we've got to pay, pay attention to because it's very significant language in the Old Testament. It's language, language that's used when, when certain people or certain religious leaders, people that are leading God's people, uh, get to the end of their ropes and they need, they need God's revelation. They need to see that God is real, that he's with them. This happens a couple times in the Old Testament. It's the same language that's used. The first one, the first guy that gets to the end of his rope is Moses. Exodus 33, 19 says this. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, Moses. And I'll proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy, Moses. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Isn't that interesting? There's that whole face language again. We'll see his face in eternity. The disciples see his face in the boat. But at this point in redemptive history, you can't see my face and live, Moses. And the Lord said, behold, there's a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, then I will make, then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So the Lord's presence is passing by his people. It's about him breaking into our lives and drawing near to us when we're at the end of our rope and we need to know he's real. The Lord's been closing that chasm since the day it was created in Genesis 3, like we talked about. Moses is at the end of his rope, and why is he? You know what happens just before this in the text? He's up on the mountain for 40 days, Mount Sinai, getting God's revealed word to give to his people. They've been delivered out of, uh, out of um, uh, Egypt, right? And they're in the Exodus, you know, wandering into the promised land. And uh, he has a word for him. He'd come down off the mountain. His right-hand man, Aaron, the best priest he knows, is leading his people in a worship service to a golden calf, right? I'd be mad, too. I'd be in despair, too. Brandon led you guys to, you know, I'm not pretending to be Moses, but I came down here and you guys were worshiping a golden calf. You'd be in despair, right? What has happened? Um, and so he's in despair, and the Lord says, let me show you who I am, Moses. Let me just give you a glimpse of who I am. There's this other guy at the end of his rope in 1 Kings 19. His name's Elijah. God told him to go kill all the prophets of Baal, and so he does it. And as you can imagine, King Ahab and Jezebel are going to kill him, right? They are out to take his life, and all because he obeyed God, right? He's alone. He's at the end of his rope, and he's wondering if God is real and if there's anybody with him. And here's what happens in 1 Kings 19.10. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've thrown down your altars, and they've killed your prophets with the sword. And I... Even I only am left, and they seek to take my life away as well. That's a desperate man crying out to God, isn't it? And the Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore through the mountains. He's revealing the power of his glory to him, right? And it broke into pieces in the rocks before the Lord, and the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake Another forceful show of God's power, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake is a fire. The Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he knew. He knew that was God. 
And he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him. God revealed his glory to Elijah and to Moses just in the nick of time, just like he does with us. His glory revealed to us uh, is in the, he always reveals his glory to us in ways that draw us into his covenantal story of redemption, doesn't he? He shows it to us just in the nick of time when we're at the end of our rope. You know, passing by is the way that God has always spoke about revealing his glory. This is like a New Testament theophany, which is a, where theophany is a theological term where God would show up in the Old Testament and reveal himself. Jesus would show up, he'd He'd bust onto the scene in the Old Testament. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Theophany shows up. This is Jesus basically becoming a living theophany for his disciples. Because they see his glory. It's revealed to them. And they proclaim it back to him. You see, Moses got to see his back. But because of God's grace, friends, we get to see his face for all of eternity. In this instance, Jesus is saying to these Jewish boys who knew the word of God well, I am the God you've been reading about. But without the storm, they wouldn't have been in the position to see his glory. They wouldn't have seen him. They didn't see him in the feeding of the 5,000, but they saw him when they needed him. Next time you're in a storm, metaphorical storm here, a situation where you're at the end of your rope, we might ask these kinds of questions. What aspect of your character, Father, and your nature, Father, do you seek to reveal to me through this? What do I need to know about the big picture of your story in this moment? What do I not know or believe about you that you desire to reveal to me through this situation? Because seeing Jesus rightly is what we all need to get through the storm and every other one we're going to encounter until we see him face to face. So this chasm that we feel and this struggle we face and this glory that's revealed are all culminating into something that we all long for. And it's this, a comfort that we can actually receive. The comfort that we can actually receive. You ever, you ever heard that phrase, we're, we're all in the same boat here? Well, we're all in the same boat as the church, but the good news is Jesus is in the boat too, amen? He's with us in the boat. So what changes by the fact that Jesus gets into the boat with his struggling people? Everything, right? Jesus forms us in the storm before he frees us from the storm. He does that with his disciples. He does that with you and with I. As Colossians 1 says, that the, my the mystery of this life is profound, that it's Christ in us, which is the hope of glory. That the glory that Jesus reveals to us when we see him as he is, is actually what we were made for. That longing that you have to be more fully known, to be more fully loved, was put inside of you by the only one that can fill it. You know, you know what's not included in this story, though? I find it interesting. So a little bit of background. We believe that Mark, who wrote this gospel account, was Peter's kind of right-hand man. And we believe this is kind of Peter's gospel, honestly. I mean, that's what a lot of commentators believe. I definitely see it. You know what's not included? What happens with Peter in this instance? You guys remember what happens with Peter if you've read the Bible before? Uh, here, let me remind you if you haven't. It's interesting. I don't know why it's not in here, but it's interesting. So J Jesus has just come to them on the sea. He's standing out there. They're terrified. They think he's a ghost. He says, take heart, side. Don't be afraid. And here's what Peter says. Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus says, okay, come. So Peter gets out of the boat, and he walks on the water, and he gets to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reaches out his hand, takes hold of him, saying to him, you have little faith, why did you doubt? And I think a lot of times we read that and we poke fun at Peter, but Peter was so bold, he actually believed what God said. I, I love that about Peter. And so they get into the boat, verse 32, and the wind ceases because Jesus is in the boat with them. And peace follows, you know, anytime Jesus is with you, peace follows, right? And so those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Now, you know, I think there's a little bit of Peter in each and every one of us, isn't there? You know, that leap for glory, 
coupled with the terror of the uncertainty that surrounds us, right? It's like, yeah, maybe it's true, I don't know, you know? It kind of lives inside of each and every one of us, and I think that's how God is completing his work in each and every one of us. We're all filled with that, that reach for glory, but also that fear of what surrounds us. But this world steals that, that leap for glory inside of each of us over and over and over again. And I want to encourage you this morning to not despair when that glory that you were made for, you know, when you see Jesus as he truly is and it gives you peace in your heart even though your world is crazy, you know, that, those are moments when you are apprehending the glory of God. I want to encourage you not to despair when that glory that you were made for seems elusive. It seems to slip right through your fingers like it did for Peter in that moment. You know why I want to encourage you? Because Jesus is going to keep showing up in our story, friends, isn't he? He's going to keep showing up. He's going to keep pursuing us. He's going to keep closing that chasm in each and every one of us. And the great news is, is that this elusive glory that we seek won't last forever because we will see him face to face for all of eternity. Do you know that the very first time the disciples proclaim that Jesus is the Son of God, do you know when that is? It's right here in this moment. It's right here in this moment when they, they proclaim, Jesus, you are the Son of God. You are the triune God of the universe. And it was through the struggle, right? It was watching Peter fail, right? Coupled with that pursuit of glory and that fear. It was all in this moment because the storm and the struggle in the storm is doing something in each and every one of us, friends. His glory is revealed, and when it's received, it changes us all. 2 Corinthians 3, 17 and 18 talks about it like this. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled faces, that's glory language from the Old Testament, are beholding the glory of the Lord, and we're actually being transformed into the same image, the face of Jesus, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So what's this mean? We're all being transformed through our struggles from one degree of glory, apprehension of who God is and comfort that we receive from knowing that to, to another degree. And we're all learning to surrender through the experience of our struggle. While it may not be how we, how we expect it to change us, our lives are changing. He can't help but change you in the midst of this battle. Now, when we get to be with Jesus at his return, we'll have no problem seeing the big picture. We'll laugh about it and cry. Actually, we won't cry. We can't cry anymore. But anyway, we will, we <laughs> we'll see him as he is. The pain won't be there anymore. It'll be beautiful. But until that day, what are we left to do? We struggle forward in an apprehension of glory with hope. And as we turn to this table today, this table proclaims the chasm closing love of God. I want you to close your eyes for a moment, and you guys can go ahead and kill the, the house lights back there. And I, wanna, I just want to prep us for this table by reading a part of Romans 8 for you. Because it starts with a promise, and it ends with a promise too. And it's powerful. Romans 8, 28 through 39. And we know those, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image, that image of glory of his son. And those whom he predestined, he also called, and those whom he Called, he also justified. He made them right. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. There's the big picture for us. Verse 31, so what should we say to these things? What should we say to these struggles? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? No. No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure 
that neither life nor death nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, church, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And friends, that is the anthem of the church. Hey, Pastor Ryan here. We're so glad that you've tuned in with us and watched one of our online sermons. Our vision as a church is to live as the family of God together proclaiming and demonstrating the gospel of grace to one another in our city. If you don't have a church home or you're looking for a church, we'd invite you to attend one of our in-person worship gatherings so you can experience all that God has for us as a community of believers on mission.